Hi everybody, it's Adam with heartvalvesurgery.com and this is a special surgeon question and answer session all about the future of heart valve therapy. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Michael Acker, who is the chief of the Division of Cardiovascular Surgery at Penn Medicine in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. During his incredible career, Dr. Acker has performed over 9,000 cardiac procedures of which 3,000 have involved either a valve repair or valve replacement. Needless to say, I'm excited to bring him onto the call. Dr. Acker, are you there? Yes, hi Adam. Hey Dr. Acker, thanks for joining us today. And you know, I, we we're gonna get to our topic about the future of heart valve surgery, but I've got a couple questions just about you and your practice there. Gotta start with this one. When and why did you decide to become a cardiac surgeon? Well, I guess I always was knew I wanted to be a doctor, and and frankly, there was nothing cooler than being a surgeon. And then if you look at all the different types of surgery, well, heart surgery is so cool: stopping the heart, starting it, fixing it, opening it up. The technology was really uh, sort of really cutting edge and exciting, and also it was very dramatic and romantic to be a heart surgeon. So, it, it, as I went through my training as a surgeon, there was nothing that could compare to the, the uh, romanticism and the excitement of heart surgery. Dr. Acker, I love hearing about your passion for cardiac surgery. Uh, let's talk about valves, which are a very big part of your practice. What attracted you to heart valve surgery? When I started heart surgery in the mid-90s, 90% of what was heart surgery was coronary bypass surgery. So it was a sort of untapped field, if you will. The second thing that really influenced me was an early association with uh, uh, Alain Carpentier, who was probably the founder of valve heart surgery, if you will, as well as the guy who really developed the reproducible techniques on how to repair the mitral valve so you didn't have to replace it. Dr. Acker, I did not know about your connection to uh, Dr. Elaine Carpentier. That is fantastic. And I've got to ask you, given your tremendous history and knowledge of heart valve surgery, would you say it has evolved or radically transformed during your career? I think it's both. Uh, like most things, um, you just don't flip a switch in medicine, right? Uh, what you do, you evolve, you build on previous evolution and previous steps as, you know, you stand on the shoulders of the people that went before you. Dr. Acker, can you maybe give us an example of this simultaneous evolution and radical transformation? Uh, certainly the mitral valve is a nice example, right? When I was training, very few mitral valve repairs were done. Uh, we replaced valves by cutting out as much tissue as possible and putting in the biggest valve possible. That's not done anymore. Now we do just the opposite. The, the whole structure of the mitral valve is intimately related to the left ventricle and we try to maintain that. We've also developed Carpentier's techniques to such a great degree, they're very reproducible. I teach them to my residents now and they leave our residency training really expert at mitral valve repair. Dr. Acker, I'm really curious to know, is it possible that these evolutions and reproducible techniques are enabling you to treat patients who maybe you previously wouldn't treat. We operate on people that have much uh, sicker hearts with mitral valve uh, regurgitation than we ever would have tempted. They would have all died. And now we can get people with sick hearts through and make them better. As all this was happening, we were also evolving our approach to the mitral valve. Uh, can we do it through smaller incisions? Can we do it using laparoscopic instruments? Can we do it with the assistance of uh, the robot, which also evolved over the last 20 years? Uh, can we uh, do it with new technologies such as the Heartport Endo Balloon, which came about actually in the late 90s and developed from there? And yeah, we can. And while that was all developing, the aortic valve space was also developing, right? Developing with a, a catheter-based approach, the so-called TAVR procedure. And Penn, under the leadership of my partner, Joe Bavaria, was one of the first in the country to do the catheter-based aortic valve replacement, the TAVR, which we did in 2007. 
specific to patient risk, Dr. Acker, how has TAVR evolved? We went from doing only the highest, highest risk patients that couldn't tolerate surgery to high risk, to intermediate risk, and now to low risk. It still leaves us, I would say, about 20% of aortic valve replacements are done open surgically. But the vast majority, 80%, and not only are they done with the catheter-based technique, they're done with being awake. They don't go to sleep. And they can leave it, you know, leave the hospital in two, two days or so. So yeah, that's a tremendous evolution. I've got to ask, did all the success around TAVR spark a wave of transcatheter interest for the mitral valve? Oh, this venture capital technology. Well, we can do it with the aortic valve. Can't we do the same thing with the mitral valve? Are there mitral valve repair techniques and technologies? And they developed about 10 to 15 years ago. The first one, the mitral clip by Abbott. It's basically a clothespin that pinches the anterior and posterior leaflets together. And can that be a way to help some people? And it was sort of not that dramatic, great result that we saw with TAVR, but a sort of iterative result. Well, we can get severe down to moderate, in some cases less. What we found was it was more effective in a different space, the so-called functional or secondary leak space, secondary to a heart attack. And as the MitraClip sort of developed, other companies jumped in, artificial cords and uh, annular rings and all these that could be placed without open heart surgery. Again, no like, you know, grand slams, but little l l learning, right? Is there any one specific innovation that you're most excited about right now? I'm very, very interested in the uh, TMVR technology, the replacement of valves without, um, without open heart surgery, without putting sutures in. And I think that's really going to take off in the next five years. And I, I've heard because of the complexity of the mitral valve, um, it's not as simple as TAVR, not saying that TAVR has been easy getting to where we are with that. Is there some truth to that? It's a little more complex TMVR than well, TAVR? I, yeah, yeah I, think, I think it is, Adam. I think the, the mitral valve, for one, is intimately associated with the left ventricle itself. It also is very, very close to the aortic valve. Um, it also is rarely involved with that heavy calcium where TAVR is, relies on that calcium to sit and not move. So new technologies that, that uh, anchor, new anchoring technologies had to be developed. Um, so it is more complex. Also, the mitral valve insufficiency is somewhat more complex than just aortic stenosis. So proving effectiveness is more difficult. Uh, than, than in aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis kills you quickly. Mitral valve leak probably doesn't. So the trials that are, need to be developed need to be longer term than the aortic valve. So everything is, is going to be more complex. So Dr. Acker, a big question I have for you is, what's next for heart valve therapy? I see it slowly evolving over the next decade to the point where I think that many patients will be able to be addressed transcatheter, smaller incisions, robotically, and sick patients will still perhaps need a surgical open heart repair, but yet we know how to get those hearts through. So there's been a lot of innovation, a lot of evolution, all to the uh, really benefit to our patients. Dr. Acker, I love that you brought it back to the patients because there's no doubt that these evolutions and innovations and technologies have been helping you treat patients from heartvalvesurgery.com like Patricia Garcia, Michael Casey, and Teresa Gusson. And I, what I want to do now is I want to thank you on the behalf of all the patients out there for your leadership there at Penn Medicine, for all the great research you and your team have been doing to further this space and uh, again, taking time away from your very busy practice uh, to share your clinical insights and your experiences with our community. I can't thank you enough. So thanks for being with us again today. And as we always say here, keep on ticking. Yeah, thanks, Adam. It's been really a, a lot of fun talking to you today. All right, take care, Dr. Acker. Bye-bye.